Welcome to CS Guitars, the science of loud. I hope you all had a wonderful new year. I'm back to work after a little break, getting stuff done for some new video content. But while that's all going on, I thought you might want to see some behind the scenes content for the recent BC Rich Ultimate Teenagers Metal Guitar video. There was a lot to the process of creating this that didn't make its way into the main video and usually all that extra content gets bundled together and released on Patreon. Patreon is a fantastic way of financially supporting what I do here and members pledging $3 or more get to see exclusive behind the scenes content like what you're about to see. Other support levels will give you access to the Patreon area in the Discord where we all collaborate on what new content will look like and access to the monthly live streams where we all get to hang out and have fun. So the following segment was released on Patreon a few days ago. They've all seen it, they've all been talking about it and normally you wouldn't know anything about it. So if you don't wanna miss this kind of content in the future, then follow the link to the Patreon, it's in the description and become a paying member of the community. Welcome you Patreon people, happy new year. We're going to start off 2021 by looking back at the BC Rich and its myriad spikes, skulls and of course the embedded metal zone. This is a guitar that not only contains the COVID 5G tracking chip, but it could also administer it. There were a number of points during this build which I didn't touch upon in the main video because I was going for a shorter, snappier, memeier video. I was trying to play the algorithm and get a viral hit for Christmas. Yeah, it did okay. I think the spikes are probably the part that most people had questions about as the process was very quickly glossed over in the video. Here you can see the extent of the work involved. I firstly need to measure out the center lines and get the spacing uh, reasonably equidistant between the spikes. I know this was supposed to be a teenager mindset build and perhaps I wouldn't have taken the time to do this as a goth teen, but I wanted it done properly, or at least as properly as my deadline would allow. Once the positions were marked, I used a 10mm Forstner bit to recess all of the holes. Forstner bits leave a flat, even bottom to the hole and won't chip the paintwork like a normal bit would. This was a fresh, sharp bit and it sliced through that urethane finish cleanly. These recesses are only deep enough to accept the base plates of the spikes, which look like this. The largest bases are 10mm to match the Forstner bit, but some have a smaller diameter. Knowing this, it was important to use black nitro to paint in the holes before installing the spike bases. This, with the epoxy, would make the oversized holes basically invisible when the spikes were installed. For the epoxy, I used these double bubble sachets. This has a three minute work time and there isn't much epoxy in the packet. I knew I wouldn't be needing much and I ended up using four of the five sachets I purchased for this task. Although I did waste most of the first one, it set on the mixing pad while I was fucking around with really poor technique. You can see me here dipping each base into the epoxy one at a time. Not only did this take too long, but this made a mess and didn't get enough epoxy in the holes. I also noticed that the bases were too smooth and shiny and the epoxy wasn't holding them well. So I had to go and sand all of the bases to ensure a surface the epoxy could uh, grab onto. I didn't film the rest of the process, but I quickly learned that I should be running masking tape along all the edges, cutting out the holes from the tape, dumping the epoxy directly into the holes, and then jamming the bases in before the thing set. This technique worked very well. I lifted the tape after the epoxy was mostly set, leaving only a little cleanup. The almost set up epoxy is still rubbery enough that it can be easily removed from the gloss finish. I left the epoxy to set up overnight so that it was nice and hard by the time I went to install the spikes. The spikes were screwed in in what I consider to be an aesthetically pleasing arrangement of alternating sizes. There are 47 spikes in total, which answers a question that was brought up in our last live stream, which I didn't know the answer to because I hadn't bothered to count them before now. How many spikes? I didn't count the spikes. I, I actually don't know how many of the spikes were used on that guitar. I still have a good number left over. Um, I had small, medium and large spikes. Only, there's only three or four of the large spikes got used, but I think I used almost all of the medium spikes and there was maybe 20 of them. There's maybe 20 of them. Yeah, I think there was 20 medium spikes, 20 large spikes and then 50 small spikes. So definitely I used almost the 20, maybe about 18 of the of the medium spikes, 
four of the large spikes, and then a lot of the small ones, but nowhere near uh, hitting that 50. I've still got a lot of them left over. Regarding the spikes, people have asked what injuries I sustained, if any. The only time I hurt myself uh, was the first time I went to pick up the guitar after installing the spikes, and I managed to jam one of the tall, pointy ones under my fingernail, which was not, um, not in the least a pleasant experience. Other than that, there was no impalement, but I do have to be careful around the spikes, not for my safety, but for theirs. With the bases being recessed so shallowly, it's actually very easy to break these off the guitar. The long spikes especially have sufficient leverage for this to be very little effort. I consider this to be somewhat of a safety feature though, uh, I'd like to think that if you fell on the guitar, the spikes would snap off before you could penetrate your flesh, although I don't think I'm brave enough to put that uh, to the test. Of course, when it comes to setting down, I can unthread all the spikes on the lower reaches of the instrument and I'm just left with these small threads, which aren't really an issue of discomfort, unless of course I was playing this naked. Now what about that metal zone then? I'm actually surprised that I didn't get more questions about how this was done. I did notice one person ask in the comments if it was operative or purely decorative, and frankly I'm insulted that anyone would think that I'd install a metal zone into a guitar and not make it fully operational. Yes, this does work, it's wired between the volume control and the guitar output. The signal chain is pickups to selector switch, to master volume, to metal zone, to guitar output. However, there were a few logistical problems to solve. Battery powered pedals turn on when the cable is connected. The barrel of the plug bridges contacts in the stereo socket which engage the battery. I want this permanently wired in, but I don't want the battery running all the time. Fortunately, by upgrading the guitar to have active pickups, I install the stereo jack for the guitar output which engages the battery for the pickups upon cable insertion. It was a simple case therefore to run a wire between the metal zone and the ring lug on the guitar out to turn on the metal zone power source when the guitar gets plugged in. So a cable into the guitar turns on both the pickup and pedal power sources, although they are both drawing from a different power pool. You'll notice the pedal is a nice snug fit in its route, and this was achieved by removing the pedal jacks and running the wires through the square power socket hole in the rear of the chassis. This involved desoldering the power jack from its position on the PCB and bridging the board to allow the battery power to carry through. The power sockets break the battery connection when a power cable is inserted. This means the traces on the board aren't connected and removing the jack leaves them unconnected permanently. A little jumper wire in the right place makes this work. In addition to the wire that turns the battery on, the only other wires that are being pulled through here are signal in, signal out and ground. The metal zone is mounted with two machine screws from the rear, spreading the force with these recessed cups. The machine screws that I had to hand were entirely different thread pitch to the ones uh, used to hold the base plate onto the pedal, therefore I had to tap new threads into the die cast pedal chassis to accept the new screws. Installing active pickups into an instrument that was originally passive is a pretty easy process. These pickups and all the associated electronics were removed from the Harley Benton not long ago, so I already had everything that I needed to make this work. Active pickups required 25k pots as opposed to the 500k pots uh, the passives had. They also need to have a stereo jack as described previously and they need a battery to power them. Fortunately there was enough space in the existing cavity to house the battery. For a little extra class I picked up these 9 volt flip top housings and uh, modified the control cavity plate to allow me to access the battery at all times from the outside. I ended up using the Metal Zone's base plate screws to hold this to the control plate. It's a very neat and self-contained solution using the existing routing and those are the kind of mods I like, you know, minimally invasive. There's uh, not really much to say on the hardware, it was all drop-in replacement, everything lined up perfectly with the exception of the jack plate. This was a different shape and required new holes drilled to fix it. The stickers were a bulk by eBay job. I chose the ones that I thought most stereotypical for a metal teen in the mid 2000s. There was a lot of other stickers in there which would not have been appropriate, quite a few Beatles, um, Rolling Stones and that sort of thing, uh, which would not have classified I suppose for someone putting spikes in a metal zone onto a guitar. Um, but they may get used somewhere in the future if I need for any more stickers. And of course the swear word was Tory. 
So this build was not without its frustrations. There were a few points where I fucked up the wiring and short-circuited the battery, but on the whole, it was a hugely enjoyable and worth sacrificing a perfectly good metal zone for. I'll need to think of something very clever to top this one. Thank you once again, Patreon, for all your support. Let's chat this through more on the Discord if there are any additional questions you have. That's all for now, though. Keep it loud, and I'll see you later.